You're listening to Travel Tales with Fergal. The Travel Tales with Fergal podcast is a weekly interview series that hopes to fuel listeners' wanderlust while we all wait for post-pandemic travel. We may not be able to travel right now, but this podcast aims to share so lifting travel memoirs about daydream-worthy destinations. I'm delighted to say that we've David McWilliams this week. In our chat, David describes Donald Trump as that old guy who sidles up to you in a bar and you don't want to talk to. David is the exact opposite of that. He's the guy you do want sitting beside you in a bar because no matter what topic comes up, you learn something new and interesting. I really hope that you enjoy this episode as much as I did doing it. Well, let's, we can rock and roll. I mean, yeah. Fergal, I've, I haven't prepared a thing. Actually, just I might as well start off with, um, I did a couple of podcasts with I have a, a friend who's a Democrat who lives in Ireland and he's a friend who's a Republican in America. And uh, we did a couple episodes about America called What's the Matter with America? And I was sending him um, your podcast as homework with Thomas <laughs> Franks. <laughs> oh, well, and Tom's very good, isn't he? Amazing. Absolutely amazing. That's how I ended up calling What's the Matter with America? He really yeah, sums sweet, it up. He, yeah, well, it's funny. I actually bought that book for my son, who was meant to start college, but is like here at home. And... Uh, he listens to the podcast. He doesn't listen to the podcast very often because it's fair enough. He can't listen to your alpha. But I said, look, look, this is a guy who you should really listen to. Yeah. And he then just said to me, Dad, can you get me that book? The What's the Matter with Kansas? And I just got it for him yesterday because it's a great, great book. I read it years ago. And uh, yeah, there's a lot the matter with America. A lot the matter with America. You know, it puts our dilemmas into perspective. I know. I mean, you can already feel it, can't you, in the last week? You know what I mean? If it's possible that the calmness. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's just it's just that the, the, the malignancy seems to be gone. I mean, he, Trump is a malignant person. There's no doubt of that. As I said to your brother-in-law, he's the sort of fellow you'd hate to meet at a bar. Exactly. Imagine like, imagine, imagine that fellow sidling up beside you at a bar and saying, show, show over there, I want a word with you. God almighty. I mean, you know, and you know, as a, as a, as a publican, you know this type of creature. It's just Biden. I mean, I, I'm 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 sure he's got his work cut out for him, but it, it's it's a it's a it's a totally different tone, and, yeah. and tone is important. You know, and messaging is important, and language is very important, and the way in which you behave, like the way in which Trump kind of pardoned all these gangsters, and you know, like oh. uh, somebody referred to the Trump family as a criminal conspiracy, not unlike the uh, Sopranos, and I, and I think it's quite right. Yeah. And did you live in America? Did you work there? Like everyone, like everyone, I uh, I couldn't be arsed getting a J1. I remember us standing outside USIT in the rain in January of presume 1984, 85, but I don't know, about 86 or 87. And I remember thinking to myself, there was USIT and then the stag's head was very close. And I said, I couldn't be arsed. I'm going to go for a few pints and chance my arm. So therefore I go into America without a J1, with all the J1ers. And in fact, uh, I think an auntie in Yonkers was produced from my memory uh, who never existed. And she was produced and a letter was produced from her. And uh, at the end of the day, in I went, slipped in on a holiday visa. I worked in a, disappeared into the kitchens of New York and then up further up to Boston and had great crack. I used to love, I mean, America in the 80s as an Irish student was paradise for us. It was, you could work, you could make money. It was, think about this, is well before Homeland Security. And uh, it was a very welcoming place. And it was brilliant. I mean, Ireland was such a dump at the time. And New York was New York. So it was really a wonderful, wonderful. And now again, since then, I would have been over and back all the time, all the time. But I haven't been there for, for quite a long time now. I mean, certainly in the 90s, I went much more regularly. Um, I find getting shouted at by overweight, second rate border guards a bit annoying, yeah. you know. So mm-hmm. if I if I if I if I've got to go to America, yeah, I'll go there. But I did quite a lot of traveling to the Caribbean in the last couple of years because I was working for the International uh, Development Bank of the Caribbean and one of the 
obvious ways is to go fly to Dublin, New York, and then New York down to uh, either Miami or from Dublin or, or into these places in the Caribbean. And I found that very, very relentlessly depressing the way in which people were treated at the uh, the so-called door of the United States, you know. Um, so I like the States, but, you know, not not overly enamored with it in the sense that I could live with that. Unlike many Irish people of my generation, you know, it's it's great and I respect lots lots from this America, but uh, I can't say it would change my world if I didn't go there for quite some time. I know you've been to you've been to Cuba, haven't you? Is that right? You were. Oh, I've been to Cuba. My my yeah. my son has been to, been in school in Cuba. I've yeah. been to Cuba a lot of times. Uh, first there. went to Cuba in 1996 uh, with Shan, who's my missus, when we were just hanging out as kids. And I always wanted to go there. And then it, our relationship with Cuba culminated in our son. And you know, the other fella involved uh, doing their transition year or half the transition what year a great place in to Havana. To. I know, it was mad. They've yet to tell us the real inside story. Exactly. You know? I think there's certain things you've got to keep secret from your alpha. Yeah. Uh, what do you do? What, what did you do as a 15 year old in Havana for half a year? <laughs> and did you see a big change then in the country? Uh, yeah, when, 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 when I first went to Cuba in 1996, actually, people were very hungry. So you forget that uh, I had spent a lot of time in Russia. So I, I I learned Russian when I was younger, and I've been very interested in Russia all my life. And you forget that Russia kept Cuba on a lifeline for 30 years about. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed and the Russians decided that they didn't have the wherewithal, because in fact, I'd been in Russia in the late 80s, early 90s, where people were hungry as well. So when I first arrived in Cuba, there was a fair, there was a serious shortage of food in Cuba, serious shortage of food and uh, shortage of everything, petrol, food, whatever. And now when you go back, and I've gone back a number of times since, but now Cuba is, is a capitalist country where markets work on the ground level. So what you have is this extraordinary situation where you have this vibrant, vibrant economy you know, in bars and restaurants and all that sort of stuff, incredibly vibrant. And then you've got this extraordinary sclerotic economy on the top, which is the state apparatus. But uh, I enjoy I enjoyed Cuba a lot. The people were fun, very friendly. But talking to my son, who spent time there living with a Cuban family, he was very adamant that the people are deeply unhappy, right. uh, are deeply uh, frustrated with the system. There's no real way out for them and, and the world has changed you know and the, the the promise of Fidel and Che that's a long time ago and only I would say nostalgic Marxists who probably tend to have worked in the Irish public sector and are now sitting on large pensions traveling on cycling trips to Cuba <laughs> have any real uh, nostalgia for that yeah. I think the reality for Cuban people is quite quite grim. And they probably all know people that have gone off to college in America or gone over to visit relatives. So they see what the other world is like, well, you know. Cal was saying like when, when, when himself and Tom were going out because they were English speaking kids and because it was very clear that they were they were foreigners, uh, they, they, they started going to you know teenage bars where they said, look, the sons and daughters of the very well connected would drink. And as you said, they had brothers and sisters in Canada are in the United States in college. And he said it was clear there was one avenue open to apparatchiks, which was always the case. You know, yeah. China's the same. It's the same in Ireland. If you look at if you look at Ireland, you know, you can trace back, you know, I've always thought it was very funny. You can trace back in Ireland, you know, so many prominent people in, in, the, in the various professions, uh, trace and, and, poli and politics as well, you know, trace their ancestry back to people in the 1916 rising. Right. Those of us who never participated in this thing, right, whose, whose grandparents were coppers on the other side, we got nothing out of the new state. But, you know, new states are set up and a, and a, and a nomenclatura uh, imposes itself on the state and they give out the goodies to their mates. So if you look at all the heads of Irish uh, semi-state bodies for years and whatever, they were all daughters and sons of the fellows who were shooting in, in 1916. So the revolutionary cadre tend to become the bourgeoisie very quickly. Yeah, you kind of forget. I, I noticed the other day something showed me kind of how small Ireland is on Sunday morning. There was a it was essentially Belfield Radio telling old stories about I think it's 50th anniversary or something. So there was like telling old stories about drinking in the bar in Belfield. And I was going, God, we're a small country. Well, that must be I mean, that must really 
you know, you piss off people. Uh, if you think about 50 years ago, uh, I know these statistics because I've been doing a lot of work on it. Nine percent of our population went to university. It's now above sixty percent. So you'd imagine you're listening to, and I presume that was radio was on RT Radio right? One. Pres- yeah, yeah. I presume it wasn't on on any sort of non-state yeah, broadcaster. No, exactly. So you know how alienated and distant would you feel from that if you heard all these people chuckling because already they were a tiny minority of the population. And then the ones who, let's say, do sufficiently, notoriously well to be recognized are a tiny minority of a tiny minority. So uh, I'm always aware of that, you know, that, that, yeah. that there, there, there is certainly in, in you know, yeah. broadcasting, of which I've been a part for many years, it's a very small gene pool. Yeah. But the, my point about the, the revolutionaries, I think, is well made and yeah. we don't make it that often. And what is it like? So you said there about working in the Caribbean area. Is it very different then in other countries yeah. in the Caribbean? Well, the countries I, I work most in is Trinidad. Trinidad is a fantastic country, yes. um, but very violent and, and quite dangerous. Um, it's a petro country. So it's unusual for the Caribbean because it's a petro company. So if you imagine geo, geologically, Trinidad is very close to Venezuela very, very large uh, gas and oil deposits. Fantastic city, Port of Spain, really wonderful. Basically what happened is the, 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 the development bank, of the, so there's basically there's people like me, Fergal, in Ireland who can never get a gig in Ireland. So we end up, fantastic, it's, it's a brilliant thing. So we end up doing our work abroad, you know, <laughs> and the development bank of the Caribbean is, well, what it says in the tin, it's a bank that tries to support development policies and economic policies that would be, uh, long term would support the education in particular of the people. Um, the Caribbean is amazing. I mean, Jamaica is a fantastic country. But as I've said to anybody, if you if you really want to understand the Caribbean, you should read the novels of, of Marlon James, a Jamaican writer uh, who won the Booker Prize a couple of years ago. And he wrote a fantastic novel called The Book of Night Women, which is basically about the impact of slavery on the Caribbean mentality. And if you go to the Caribbean, what you realize is that there is a extraordinary darkness there. So the, the marketing pitch, Fergal, is, you know, sun, sand, sex, sangria, ganja, yada, 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 right? Okay. But actually, underneath, and, and, and this sort of notion that the people are all wonderfully uh, friendly and all that sort of stuff like a liltad, okay? <laughs> but actually, underneath you have uh, an amazing, amazing story of trauma, of subjugation, of slavery, of unbelievable violence against the people, unbelievable violence perpetrated. I mean, the, the, the slave plantations in the Caribbean made the slave plantations in, on, the, on, the, on the American mainland, okay, uh, look like reasonably well-run establishments. It was horrendous violence uh, perpetrated against the people, dehumanizing, and destroy them. That's the black folk. Then you have the Indian population, which is very, very big in the Caribbean. People don't seem to realize it's a huge Indian population. And they came in as indentured servants uh, uh, when slavery was abolished. So the British abolished slavery and they said, oh, we, we need to have somebody else to come in here and do the job. So they took Indians from Gujarat in the east of India and they basically plant, planted them and they said, for 10 years you work the fields and then we'll give you a, a bit of land. So they're also a, quite a traumatized population. And when you, there's a very good book called From Columbus to Castro, written by a chap called Williams, his second name is Williams, he's the first prime minister of Trinidad. And if you're interested in the Caribbean, I would read those books before you go. I mean, and then, you, then, of course, you go and you, I've done work in, in Cayman Islands, which is just like, you know, it's, it's, it's like PWC in the sun, you know? Yeah. It's basically all accountants. But the, the history of the Caribbean is, is less buoyant, upbeat, and sunny than you'd imagine. And I can, I can feel that if you go to, I always advise people to go to the Caribbean to go to Christian uh, churches, because there's a very, very large and very vibrant Christian evangelical community there whether you're in Bahamas, Barbados, Trinidad, you know, Jamaica, right? Uh, and of course, the smaller islands even more so. And again, the, the, the faith is very strong there because how do you negotiate being a slave 
if not by embracing a universal get out clause like religion. Okay. And uh, it is really well worth going to. I mean, one of the most dramatic things you can ever go to see uh, as an observer is a, is a Caribbean funeral um, because everybody wears purple, which is and purple is not the Caribbean. Purple is the original African color of mourning. OK, so you're going all the way back to a an almost sort of voodoo type West African uh, strain of, uh, of pre-Christian religion. Really fascinating stuff. So that's the sort of stuff I do in my holidays. Go to go and observe. But, you know, because I'm always writing. So I know I always find it fascinating to link uh, anthropological rituals to what's going on in the economy, you know, because these are very, very deep. And in fact, for Irish people, if we're interested in you and you find yourself in Barbados, uh, avoid like the plague, all this Sandy Lane stuff, you know, that Dennis O'Brien and Dermot Desmond and all that. They've got a big, big hotel there. Like it's really swanky, it's really posh, but it's really white. Okay. Uh, and what you should go is go to the Atlantic side of the, of the, um, of the island, so not unlike Ireland, you know, the, the, the eastern side of the island is a little bit more swanky and protected. The Atlantic side is a bit more savage and poorer. But the Atlantic side is very black, except for the parish of St. John, which you should go to, because there you find the last of the red legs. And the red legs are the ancestors of the indentured Irish uh, Cromwellian victims who were sent there in 1641. And uh, it is an amazing, amazing. So these are kind of white. They, they look, they, they have black features, but they've got kind of pink skin. So what they are, are the really poor people who were rejected by the Anglo community, right? Because they were Irish. They were rejected by the African community because they were Europeans. And they live in the margins and they're called the red legs because when they arrived, they tried to put sheets over them to protect them from the sun, for anything to protect their heads from the sun. But because of course the sun is blistering, their legs, no matter what they could do, their legs always burnt, right? Okay, because they couldn't cover their legs, right? And actually Rihanna is a red leg and she was, Rihanna is the most famous product of Barbados. Wow. And her father uh, is a red leg. And in Caribbean culture, if you're a mixed race, a little bit white and black, you're called red. You're not called, you're not called anything else. You're called red. So there you can find the last remnants of the most least fated and arguably most interesting parts of the Irish diaspora. So forget your St. Patrick's Day parade in New York City or Boston Irish or all that malarkey. The red legs are very interesting and they're very, very poor. Uh, but they are the last remaining link that we have to the Cromwellian uh, expulsion of people from the island. It's very fascinating wow. stuff. And so St. John Parish in Barbados. That's the place to go to. I didn't, I, I didn't know we were going to get onto all this stuff. No, anyway, that's very interesting because I remember hearing a documentary once about it was a Pat, it was a St. Patrick's Day parade in the Caribbean being held in Montserrat. It's in Montserrat. That's yeah. in an island north of Barbados, where there's a very very large volcano and a very large old Irish population. But the red legs are from Barbados. And they have their own story. Yeah, it's quite amazing. And tell us, um, you mentioned there about Russia. You you actually worked in Russia, did you, at one stage? I worked in, I went to learn Russian. I, I, I took a mad notion in when the Soviet Union was collapsing that uh, the future, there was going to be a job for a Russian-speaking economist somewhere. So I went and lived with a Russian family and uh, for three months and did a... a Actually, in, in, the, in the event, it turned out a course that was a KGB, you know, a KGB course. The base of the KGB spent the, the 70s and 80s educating African uh, and Latin American communists in the language of communism, which was Russian. So Angola, Mozambique, Cuba, uh, a lot of a lot of sort of disciples of Che and Bolivar and all these things in Latin America basically would go to Russia and they'd learn Russian. And this was a KGB sponsored uh, thing and it was a different way of learning the language. So it was completely oral, it was very little written. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, a couple of those KGB guys went private like they all did, right? 
And they offer these courses to other punters. So I remember reading an ad for it in the British newspaper, The Independent at the time. And I wrote, I wrote away, like, because you didn't, there was no texting. I wrote to these people and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I went for a year, but I lived with the family for four months, this very intensive course. And I loved it. I've, ever since then, I was back in Russia last, I was like back last St. Patrick's Day. No, not, not last one, the one before the lockdown. When was that? And when, when was that? I, I was in Russia. I lived there in 1990. Wow. In uh, 1989, 1990, just when the when the whole thing was collapsing. But I would go, I'd gone back loads and loads of times. I, I, I like it a lot. I like the countryside. I like the people. I like the culture. I like the history. I like the literature. Um, I like them. And the people, are they, you know, in my experience, when I see them, they're, they, is there a trick to getting to know them? They're quite, they're tough cookies, aren't they? Uh, no, no, no. I think the I think the Russians are, are really very open, very sweet, uh, very subject to incessant propaganda by the West about them, you know, okay. and uh, naturally a little bit suspect. But but also the Russians have a great sense of their own identity and who they are, and Mother Russia and Pushkin and deep sort of the cradle of Slavic civilization, the cradle of Christianity as they'd see, they would see themselves as the home of Orthodox Christianity. And they would see themselves as the inheritor of Constantinople and the Byzantine empire. It's a very interesting, very interesting um, deep culture the Russians have. They are obviously the mother country of the Slavs and the Slavs are all over, as we know, Eastern Europe. Uh, although the relationship is a bit tricky between them all. Um, they have some fantastically, wonderfully welcoming sides to their character. Uh, I always find them. I always find they're a little bit like Irish people. Actually, uh, they're they like boozing. They like staying up late. They like telling stories. They like dancing. They they like they have the crack. But they they have uh, like a lot of Slavic people. Um, and I spend a lot of time in Croatia every year. They have a they have a melancholy in them that we don't have they have a they have a weakness for a conspiracy theory they have a but and these are all huge generalizations but the the point fergal is it's 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 a fantastic country and a fantastic interesting per place and if if you talk to russians they will say look you know at the end of the day we're more afraid of you than you are of us because after all you invaded us twice first with napoleon and then with hitler you you westerners right and we've always only tried to actually push back against you. And so their worldview is very different to our view of them. Something I was thinking was uh, for Biden, should he try to reach out to Amer or to uh, Russia now? You know, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Uh, but, yeah, I think so. I, I yeah. think so. I, I, I think that, you know, Russia's in a state of flux at the moment. I mean, there's a very, very large demonstrations going on uh, mm. for Navalny and, and they might continue. Um, there. Russia is very, very enigmatic country. So there's a thing uh, actually in Russian history called the Potemkin village. And this explains a lot of how the Russians behave. Uh, the Potemkin villages were the were something in, in, in I think it was 1758, uh, Catherine the Great uh, conquered Ukraine. And Ukraine is this massive country, but defined by the rivers that run north to south on the Russian, sort of the great Russian steppe. So one of them is the Dnieper, and it's a bendy river, and it goes around like this. And so Catherine the Great took the ambassadors of France and Prussia and Britain and all the big nations, Austro-Hungarians, whatever, on a tour down the Dnieper, okay, on a big barge, okay. And her chief general who subjugated Ukraine and was her lover was a guy called Marshal Puchemkin, okay. And uh, what he managed to do was he created these fictitious villages, at every turn on this big river, the, the barge would come into view and there'd be a massive, massive village of all these peasants cheering Catherine the Great and saying how wonderful she was. These Ukrainian peasants who were so delighted to be liberated by the, by the Russians. But in actual fact, the villages were entirely transportable. The barge would go along and then they'd transport the village up to the next one. 
right? The next bend in the river. And then suddenly there'd be a, a little fictitious village. We'll say, oh, Catherine the Great's fantastic, blah, blah, blah. And, and this is the whole idea. So the, the Westerners went back and they said, oh, wow, the Russians not only have subjugated uh, Ukraine, but the Ukrainians love them and they are liberators and they are fantastic people. So Potemkin villages have been a way of Russia for deceiving the West for years to say one thing and mean the other thing. To, I mean, this is how the KGB offered, uh, operated for so long, which is why the Americans couldn't get a handle on them, you know, just why, you know, for example, KGB trained Cuban agents had doubly infra- infiltrated everything that the Americans threw at Cuba. So because deception, enigma, mystique, conspiracies, this is their stock and trade. So once you understand that, you get a sense of, of, of how the Russian system works at the top. So Michael told me a story that he said that um, financial crisis has followed you around the world. Is that a really up? <laughs> no, I follow them around the world. Oh, you I followed them around the world, was it? Yeah. No, That's I better. Suppose, I've worked and I, I, I ended up in the 90s working. It was a great job, actually, when I look back at it now. I was a young fellow as well. As a sort of an international economist for a, for a large, large bank. And it meant that you basically ended up in almost everywhere that there was a crisis. So Serbia, Israel, Russia, Argentina, then over in, 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 in Hong Kong and in, in, in the Asian crisis. Because what happens in these crises is one day they flare up and banks large send over uh, an economist, or two or three, to try and figure out what's going on. And uh, because, and I think this is a difference, because I was Irish and most of my colleagues were English, or Swiss or whatever, they're not the same as us. Like when, 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 when you're 28 and a fella comes in, a boss comes in and says, who wants to go to Israel? You, the, the Irish fella sticks up their hand or who wants to go to Serbia? I stick up my hand. Who wants to go to Ukraine? I stick up my hand. Who wants to go to Russia? You know, whereas the, because that's our nature. We're kind of, a, we're kind of, kind of gypsy-like nomadic mm-hmm. people in that way. So I ended up, Michael is right, basically in the eye of every economic storm, big currency crisis and whatever, and uh, and loved it, and it gave me a great sense of, of how the economy works and and, and how you, yeah. Sorry, I was going to just say, did, like, did you love traveling? Like, did you love? Yeah, I love. That's why I find that's why I find this COVID thing such a pain in the arse. You know, I I, mm. I used to travel all the time. It's funny, like we're here and the, the, the kids are looking at me saying, "Jesus, Dad," you know. But uh, I I I. I, I, I think Ireland, you need to get off the island. You really do. I mean, like, I find it very hard to, to just consume Irish opinion all the time. I, I, I'm very much a citizen of the world. I'm very much a citizen of nowhere, really, and a citizen of everywhere. I've always felt myself more comfortable outside the country in many ways. Uh, than I am here, not so much more comfortable, but I there's a curiosity that clicks in when I leave Ireland that maybe is not here all the time when I'm not knocking around. I don't know why, but it's just part of my DNA. You wrote a great article there recently. I loved it. It was about business travel, and, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> but you really and hit the, the nail the in the head. Involved, yeah. Well, I, I mean, lo- you know, I love that on. idea. You know the the guy standing at the cooler going, oh God, I've got, I've got to go to Tokyo now for a week. And oh, oh I know, pay, 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 pay in the hole, giving everyone a pay in the arse. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, 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 there's I've, I've always been fascinated by hierarchy and class and status and all these small giveaways that people, messages they sent, signals they sent. So I used to always remember, yeah, working in those big companies and there'd be some Egypt. So, you know, I just, so I'm just amazed by the quality of the coffee <laughs> in the new airport in Seoul. I'm like, oh man, go away. And then he'd be saying, like, but, but I mean, the traveling is just awful. And I, you know, I feel like saying like, uh, this is like virtue signaling for assholes, right? And uh, that's the sort of stuff that, but you know, I, you know, but no one I says just, that. Do you know, it's funny because it is, it's such a cliche. People, oh, it's terrible, you know. I'm oh, it's so tra- you mean the traffic in fucking Milan the other night? <laughs> yeah. just shocking. You know, and you're sitting and bleeding on Leary in the exactly. range. Like, get out of here, man. And no, actually, I, but I've always liked that. that, that and you know I, what? I, I really, I really like the line where 
you said the real power in a company is the guy that doesn't have to leave his office. People travel to him. Well, that's always the way. If you if you look at Caesar, right? If you look at all the great emperors, they never traveled anywhere, right? So 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 travel. It's actually I think it, it definitely goes back to food, and the what I would call the cosmology of the table. So if you look at, for example, hunter gathering societies, right? Uh, when we decided to begin to to to, to hunter gatherers used to settle around, but they did settle. The idea that they were on the they were on the hoof all the time is nonsense. They they went from place to place, but the, the the politics of the table is I always find very funny. Like, you know, you come to my house, I give you my food, you sit beside me, I'm the boss man, you know, all that sort of, and that still plays out in, in, in human in human behavior. And what you notice is that the the really, really important people never travel. Okay. It's Muhammad and the mountain, okay? And basically people come to them. It's the second raters who don't understand it who spend their time turning left when they get into a plane, feeling good about themselves. You know, really posh people don't have air miles. Okay. <laughs> True. Right. Because they don't have to fucking travel because people come to them. And uh, I think that's the state of grace. You know, I, I would have thought that, you know, the international, build, you know, um, there's a great song by the Divine Comedy called uh, Come Home, Billy Bird, International Business Traveler. And it's a great, and, and of course, Neil Hannon is one of the, the finest wordsmiths he's ever written, certainly from this island. And he talks about the, the, the life of the international business traveler. And, and because I would do a lot of traveling, but I would do it beca- because I go to be doing a, a speech. And, and then the two, and it was really, and it's, that business has been knocked in the head by COVID, but it was really a nice business. But I'd, I'd be kind of more leisurely, and I'd be sitting in Dublin airport, and you'd, you'd see the geezer, you know, huffing and puffing, red-faced, knackered, a bit hungover, trying to get to the thing. And I was just thinking, somebody has misdiagnosed grudgery for style. <laughs> and uh, you'd be amazed the amount of people who spent a huge amount of time in the air. Yeah, it's true, actually. I mean, that's going to change, I think, now, isn't it? You know, I, would people see the light yeah, that you can do this? I think with- yeah, I think you. I think the Zoom things will work, but I, I mean, I hope it doesn't. I mean, I think I know. face-to-face business is actually, you know, you 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 do business with people you know, and it's hard to get to know people over Zoom. It's going to be tricky, isn't it, for, from the point of view of tr- for the travel industry? Um, I saw an article recently, and it said um, that 2019 levels of travel they won't see it until 2029, which is kind of a bit of a mad one when you think about it. Yeah, I think I think I think 2019 was what they called peak takeoff, which was the 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 the, the year which more planes from the air, which is why half of uh, Dublin's rents are being driven up by airline leasing companies, right? So you, there, there, there are there's this, there's always a there's always a link, uh, but um, yeah, that's not so not too bad. I I think that we have to be cognizant of the impact on the environment. I was a very, uh, probably a very bad example of, of how to worry about the environment, you know, traveling around quite a lot um, by plane. Uh, I don't fancy traveling around by boat, frankly. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think I, I'd like to go back to it taking us two days to get to France. Okay. But if that's what happens, you know, years ago when uh, we, we have a house in Croatia and we go there all the, all the time, that's all part of the Slavic thing, you know, uh, that, that, uh, this, that's the part of our, but we, we have a dog who's very old now. She's 13. But when she was younger, I had to drive the dog. We had to drive the dog from Dunleary to Croatia every year. And so we'd go out, out, out here at Dunleary when the boat used to go to Dunleary, go over to Hollyhead, go through the UK, go out in a place called Harridge and then go over to Rotterdam and then through Germany. And it was really nice. The full family traveled and it was a, it was a lovely way to travel, you know, and it took you four or five days to get there. But it was really nice. So we, I might do it again. Maybe just me and the missus now. I don't think, they, I don't think late teenage kids are going to be hanging out with their mum and dad worrying about the, worrying about the health of a dog. But where, uh, where is that in Croatia? The, it's an, it's uh, quite close to Split. And then it's on an island out about five or six miles. And... Uh, 
I I was working there, believe it or not, during the the Yugoslav War. Uh, I was working, I left that French bank, I told you, I went to work, work for a French bank and just between the Yugoslav Bosnian War and the Kosovo War, um, I found myself again because of this financial crisis out there and I got to see Croatia um, just after the, the end of the Croatian Serb War, it's 95, so I got to see it about 96, 97 and fell in love with it and my, my kids speak Croatian, they spend a month or two every year there uh, they are very vested lots of Croatian mates our house used to be sort of a refugee camp for Croat teenagers who'd be coming to Ireland because you forget this there was at one stage 30 or 40,000 Croatian teen- young Cro- Croats here in Ireland mm. and uh, yeah no it's a great place and it's I, uh, I get away there every summer if I can and uh, it's lovely I it's really like beautiful. it yeah, it's beautiful. It's different. You know, you're on the sea. You're it's like Inish man in the sun, if you can imagine that. Yeah. So it's got all the madness of the Iron Islands, except it's sunny. <laughs> that sounds like the ultimate. So you have a you have a big love then for the for the Eastern Europe then. So Russia, Croatia, yeah, all that. I like of... all that part of the world. Yeah, I like the I like I like the people. I like the people. I mean, don't get me wrong. If I if I could have more time of the year, I'd love to go to the Mediterranean. I mean, Croatia is really like the Med. It's like Slavs on the Med. So it's like, it's like it's like kind of Italians. The, the Croats are a bit more like Italians because they're not even Croats. Where where we go is that they're, they're a race called the Dalmatians, who are the coastal Croatians. Uh, they're very Italian. It's very Mediterranean. But I mean, you know, I, I love Spain. I love I think Spain and Portugal are fantastic countries. And if I could spend more time there, I'd love to. A trend they talk about now. I, I don't. I, I, I work a holidays or stay and work. They're talking now about people because people can, you know, I think people have discovered our digital nomads where people can work from anywhere. Yeah, but you, you know, know, Barbados is off, uh, Barbados offers a, a scheme that you can because they're that's a, an island full of hotels and Airbnbs that aren't being used now. And if you get a negative test and you quarantine for a bit, you can go there. Uh, but you know, I, I, I quite like mooching around here as well. You know, also the I think we're all probably finding this third lockdown a wee bit difficult. Yeah, uh, a bit different. yeah no, I do. I think, yeah, it's people, are, you know, it's it's not, uh, I, I find it, I don't even notice it on the podcast, people, uh, you know, writing in on Patreon and you know, I, I get the impression people are a bit fed up. So maybe, you know, this, the north of Spain, somewhere like the Picos would be quite nice. Something like Bilbao. What's the problem with Spain is, you know, you don't want to go there and you can't go out. The whole thing about Spain is going out at no. night and having a drink and eating the tapas and all that. It's but, true. Uh, you know, I think hopefully this whole thing, Fergo, will pass in the next few months. It will. And you know what? My line is be, being a publican that, say, the pubs are one of the most hit industries but my gut is that it's going to be the roaring 20s. I do think that once this thing yeah, is over, I think you're right. people will go cracked. I think you're right. And cracked is good. Exactly. Cracked is good. Hugging and pack bars. <laughs> I can't All that wait. Sort of stuff. Can I ask everyone their favourite oh, ski resort? Davos is an amazing place to ski. Uh, there's a little town beside Davos called Wiesen, uh, where because Davos was too expensive. Anyway, so yes, we have, the family have skied in... Davos, right? And it is unbelievably expensive. We did it two years and I said after, fuck this, we can't afford this, right? <laughs> but uh, there is an extraordinary, uh, if you like being up on the sticks for a while, there's an extraordinary run from Davos to Clusters, okay? And there is a fantastic, there, it's, it's, it's an amazing skiing range, but it's too expensive. What happened was, after the first year, we thought, oh, okay, we hadn't really figured out. You know the way you go and you get excited. And uh, second year, it was costing, I think it was like 25 euros for a plate of pasta for the kids at lunchtime. And I looked at Chan and I said, this ain't happening. So then we then we go to, we try to go skiing, if we can, to a place called Champaluc, which is in Italy, just over the mountain there. Uh, but the Davos... If you're, if you're, it, it, it's an extraordinary run from Davos to Clusters, but it's it's just too expensive. I it's mean, it's really, you want to be really wealthy uh, to go there, but it's unbelievably beautiful. And if you get the chance, 
to do the train from Zurich to Davos. It's beautiful. The train journey is fantastic. And the trains in Switzerland are cheap. There's actually all around, Davos is an area called Graubunden. And all around Graubunden are these beautiful, beautiful train journeys into the Alps. And they're really fantastic. They're magical. They're really magical. David, thanks very much. There was just one last question I ask everybody. Yeah. And it, so it is, um, if you close your eyes and take three deep breaths, think of your happy place, where would that be and why? Oh, it's probably looking out on Dorky Island on the last day of the Dorky Book Festival, having had no disasters, everyone enjoying themselves, and looking out of the bay, looking back towards Hof, across the bay, looking back towards the city, looking out towards Wicklow and thinking, you know, we don't live in a bad place. Brilliant. I would ask if you could please subscribe to Apple Podcast so a new episode will appear in your library every week. I would also really appreciate if you could leave a rating and a review as it helps others to discover this podcast. To find out who's on every Tuesday, please follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Travel Tales with Fergal. Stay safe and keep dreaming of future travels. Travel Tales with Virgo.